Hey y'all, and welcome back to Bourbon and Bones. This is our 19th episode, and if you're new to the channel, welcome, and if you're a faithful follower, welcome back. If you like what we're doing here, check us out on Facebook and Instagram, links below. We're going to dive into some history tonight. So the star of our show this evening is going to be Colonel E.H. Taylor, small batch. Now this small batch is a bottle and bond at 100 proof. So Colonel Taylor is made by Buffalo Trace in Frankfort, Kentucky. And this is a little bit more history about Buffalo Trace, if you want to check it out. Now, Colonel Taylor never actually served in the military. He actually only ever held a Kentucky colonelship, an honor like, like this one right here. This is my Kentucky colonelship. Got this for becoming an Eagle Scout and is the highest honor that the Commonwealth can bestow upon its citizens. Uh, and he went by Colonel E.H. Taylor. I could go by Colonel Reeve Hutchins, and if you want to call me that, I'd be all right with it. Now, Colonel Taylor was rebranded by Buffalo Trace in 2011. For decades before that, though, it was known as Old Taylor and was a staple for most bourbon drinkers. Well, just after the Civil War, Taylor bought the old OFC distillery and began to perfect the art of making Kentucky bourbon. So Colonel Edmund Haynes Taylor Jr. was the grandnephew of President Zachary Taylor, the 12th president of the United States, and he served about a year in office. And at different times in Colonel Taylor's life, he was the mayor of Frankfurt, the capital of the Commonwealth, a state representative, and a senator. By heading the OFC distillery, he grew into an absolute powerhouse of bourbon. And in 1897, he was pivotal in convincing Congress to pass what is called the Bottle and Bond Act of 1897. So this allowed the Kentucky bourbon industry a federally approved means to distinguish itself from lower grade whiskeys, mostly coming out of Ohio at the time, and really make it something exceptional and unto itself. The big question is, of course, what is the Bottle and Bond Act of 1897? What does it mean? Why is it important? And in bourbon history it was absolute pivotal point in American spirits. So bottled and bond spirits must be produced in one distilling season, and that's from January to June and July through December. And it's at a single distillery by a single distiller, and it must be aged in federally protected and bonded warehouses under U.S. government supervision for a minimum of four years, and it must be bottled at exactly 100 proof. And exactly 100 proof is interesting because back here I have a bottle that's 100.1 proof. And that kind of variation was, would never be allowed under the Bottle and Bond Act. The bottle's label as well must have the DSP number of the distillery and the information on the distillery of where the spirit was distilled and aged and bottled. And if those are different, they both have to be on there. For example, Four Roses and to my knowledge, they've never made a bottle and bond product, but if they were to, bourbon is distilled and aged in Lawrenceburg, Kentucky, but it is actually shipped and bottled in Louisville, Kentucky. So both DSP numbers would have to be on that bottle if it were to exist. And most importantly of all, it must be distilled, aged, made from, used water from, and bottled of American soil products. Before and really after the Bourbon and Bond Act, some American spirits were colored with tobacco and iodine, and they were used to age the whiskey, basically turn them brown. And so the Bonded Label Act allowed customers to know what they were getting as a truly superior product. And the question that really remains now is, is it really important today? Ultimately, no. There's so much regulation around the spirit industry now that everybody produces a high quality product in that it is aged. It has a certain amount of grains, all that's under a lot of uh, the Food and Drug Administration's protection. So it has to be quality. It can't be just tobacco juice or iodine poured into a bottle anymore. But there is still the question of why do companies still make a bottle and bond if they don't need to? It's a lot of extra steps that's not really required anymore. And I think the biggest reason is tradition. The thing that people need to remember most is that Kentucky companies, 
that hold the bottle and bond nomenclature are at least around 100 years old in their greater in their greater histories and I know that there are exceptions to this and there always will be exceptions to any statement most of the time but for the most part these companies that hold the bottle and bond name to some of their products are tend to be much older companies and they built a community around the excellence of what a brand is and they don't want to lose that because if you were to take the bottle and bond away from colonel taylor everybody would notice it's been bottle and bond since the, the since the bottle and bond act of 1897 people fans would be really upset i mean this is a legacy bottle and part of it is its history of that colonel taylor push the Bottle and Bond Act. So taking that way, it would just lose its tradition. I know a lot of people today really look for the Bottle and Bond label on things, on bottles to know it's a really good quality. And honestly, I'm one of them. If I see a Bottle and Bond product, I know it's probably going to be better than its normal line of things. It doesn't always mean it. I have, I've discovered a few that weren't great. But I think that extra step just shows greater tradition and greater understanding of the history of bourbon. So let's finally dig into the bourbon. So Colonel Taylor comes in a tube and to my understanding is one of the earliest and possibly the first bourbon to be sh done in a tube. Um, of course, there's much older versions of the, old, of the old Taylor labels, but it's a great label. It's a great presentation and at $45, it's a really great gift as well. So we pull this out, awesome bottle, very classic look to it. And on the back, it has the DSP number that it was distilled in age and bottled at the old fashioned distil Cooper Distillery in Frankfort, Kentucky, DSP KY113. If you're curious, that is the old Stag Distillery, which is then 2000 Buffalo Trace. Finally, let's taste it. Hmm. So on the nose, you get a nice burnt caramels and kind of a little bit of a floral note, almost like a rose scent to it. And a little bit of cherry, just a touch, just a little bit of fruitiness as well. On the palate, it is dark, burnt caramels and nice spicy little white pepper at the back. Almost kind of like a grapey, cherry juicy quality to it. It's very fruit forward. With a nice caramel addition, caramel and vanilla addition. I think one thing is that it doesn't drink like a hundred proof. It does it towards the end because the ethanol starts to evaporate and kind of leaves this kind of drier tannin like effect. That almost can be described as peppery, but it's very pleasant. <laughs> so, and the, the finish is long actually. No, it's still really evolving Good caramel finish as well after the pepper kind of recedes. Yeah, good, good finish. And so, like always, we're gonna take a quick break. I'm gonna rest the palate, add some water, see how it evolves. So, stay with us. Welcome back to Bourbon and Bones. We are here with Colonel E.H. Taylor. A bit of water, so let's give it a taste again. So now with a bit of water, the caramel and like the red cherry really pops up. The caramel is first and then it kind of finishes with this very, uh, 
bright, almost candied cherry at the back end. That's about all you get too. It really pulls down the the rose kind of disappears, but there's a little bit of a sweetness, maybe maybe a little bit of a honey element. And just a bit of water turns this in from a smooth bourbon to somehow a smoother bourbon. Like this is caramel, vanilla, but still that dark caramel still. But still very juicy, very fruit forward still. And it does still has that nice little white pepper. This stands up really well in some water. Has a little bit of an evolution, but not as much as we've seen other places. So I guess now we come to the verdict. Colonel H. Taylor is, it's a fantastic bourbon. Is it as complex as other bourbons out there? No. Is it as complex as other bourbons out there under $45? Probably. This is a great bottle. If you have an opportunity to pick one up at MSRP, definitely do so. I know they're a little hard to get hold of, but the small batch is the most uh, produced. And a little bit of digging should be able to get your hands on one. It's usually in my collection. I usually have a few bottles of this floating around. I really enjoy it. I think it's a nice sipping bourbon. It's not as complex as some of the other things I have but I really love the fruit forwardness. I really enjoy that kind of jammy texture, which you don't find in a lot of bourbons. If I were to compare it to a wine, if you're, if you're a wine person, it reminds me a lot of a Pinot Noir because it has this really jammy, fruity flavor, but still has this great caramely vanilla aspect of it that makes it a fantastic bourbon and possibly a really underrated bourbon for a lot of people because it's just a hundred proof it is well aged i really don't think there's a lot of detraction for it so for our final transition this evening of course we're going to dive into our deep past this is lepidodendron these were pre-trees even though they grew a hundred feet tall and several feet in diameter they grew near water or in brackish swampy areas. And because they are closely related to cattails today, they reproduce by spores. And amazingly, we have several of the spores represented in the fossil record. So tonight we're not really gonna talk about lepidendrons specifically, but what led to their rise. So 250 million years ago, at the beginning of the Triassic, the Earth was still recovering from runaway global warming event called the Great Dying or the Permian Mass Extinction. It's the third mass extinction on the planet and it nearly obliterated all life on Earth. Pangaea was still together, so it stretched pole to pole across the planet and it was hot. Like the oceans were a hot tub, hot. Lands and deserts were across Pangaea large reptiles and early mammal early mammal relatives roamed around eating plant life and then around 240 million years ago it began to rain and it rained and it rained and it did so for nearly two million years so two million years of constant near constant rain and this changed the rock layers significantly so as the geologists began to discover it was layers and layers of sandstone and then all of a sudden river rock massive coal swamps mudstone everywhere so why was it so hot and how did everything change well the earth as i said before was recovering from the last major global warming event but mostly it was pangaea itself so large of a landmass that the rain clouds could not get into the center of the continent so imagine an entire world much like the Phoenix Desert area. And then all of a sudden, geologically speaking, uh, it began to get rain 
that Seattle normally gets. So a temperate rainforest degree of weather. So three, four, or five times the normal amount of rain in a year that it typically got. But I guess the big question is then, why did the rain start at all? Again, CO2 being the climate changing culprit, 235 million years ago uh, in Alaska and on the coast of Canada, huge eruptions began and they spilled billions of tons of CO2 into the atmosphere for nearly 5 million years, causing the global temperature to rise. And what happens when it gets hot? Water evaporates more quickly. So water evaporates more quickly, gets in the air, clouds get larger, clouds then can penetrate the depth of Pangaea and started to dump that water all over the continent. Now one of the groups that were trying to make it in this post-Permian world were something that you might be aware of. They were called dinosaurs. And they had very stiff competition. They were vying against, all right, understand this, these were crocodile relations that could run. So they were like two meters long and had long legs and would chase you down and eat you. That's just terrifying and amazing. Uh, also, they had herbivores at the time, which were these large tank-like proto-mammals with tusks. And they were scaly. They looked kind of more like rhinos. And they fed on the desert brush that was really low to the ground. And when it began to rain, though, the deserts vanished and the temperate rainforest began to develop. So the rain led to swamps and rivers and lowlands and these guys and their relatives, sorry, these guys <laughs> and their relatives made forest of these proto trees. And the dinosaurs survived because they actually used gastrolites. Those are the little rocks that are in stomachs, much like modern day birds do. Now our ancestors actually didn't use these. They actually only ate soft plant life. And because of that, the high fiber diet that it developed due to these guys right here, they could not compete and they died, they went extinct. So before this rain, 5% of the fossil records made up of dinosaurs. And after the rains, 95% of the fossil record was dinosauria. So this is a weird time in our world's history, but Unlike our early ancestors, we can stay inside when it rains, possibly with a nice glass of bourbon. And here we can watch the occasional shower quite peacefully. So I wanna thank you again tonight for joining us here at Bourbon and Bones. And if you like what we're doing here, like, comment, and subscribe below. Join us on Facebook and Instagram. And always remember, share a bourbon with someone. Good night.